Hello and welcome to The Cellar Door. I'm George and today I'm in Northern Tasmania in Tamar Valley. A little later on I'll be sampling some award-winning gin, but first up it's some tasty wines at Tamar Ridge. Let's go. I'm starting my journey in Tasmania's Tamar Valley, northwest of Launceston. It's a region rapidly carving out a reputation as producing some of Australia's top Pinot Noir. Nestled in the valley is Tamar Ridge, where I'm about to get a masterclass in all things Pinot from General Manager Will. Thank you so much for having us at Tamar Ridge. Oh, it's, uh, it's my pleasure. It's always great to have uh, people that are interested in coming and looking at our vineyards and talking about Pinot. I am exactly that person. <laughs> <laughs> well, I grew up literally five or six kilometres from here and then went off to South Australia and studied at Rosewood Ag College and had a dozen or so years in the Barossa, which was a lot of fun, and then moved back here about 20 years ago. So. Was Tamar Ridge here when you were growing up? Uh, no, it wasn't. So, in fact, the first experience I had working in a vineyard was a little one just back over the river, and that must have been about 30 years ago. There weren't many vines in this area back then. In fact, back in the mid-80s, there was only about 50 or 60 hectares in the whole of Tasmania. So, in this What last, are we looking at now? Probably 2,500 hectares. So, we, it's a yeah, so it's still, it's still small, but, you know, Tasmania is becoming really well known, obviously, for Pinot, for sparklings. Mm. You know, mm -hmm. we don't make massive volumes, but the, the, the quality of what's coming out of Tasmania and the value of our wines is, is very high, and that's, that's, you know, that's really where we want to be. It's the same with everything in Tasmania. You're never going to get massive volumes, but we're going to, but the whatever we do, what there's quality is, and, mm. and there's real integrity to the product. So that's, uh, that's what we try to focus on. And what drew you to Tamar Ridge? So I was working in the Barossa. I was, and I loved the Barossa, but I really wanted to... I guess be involved in what I could see as the next frontier of, t of wine in Australia and that for me was moving into some of the cool regions like Tasmania and of mm. course I'm Tasmanian so I really wanted to be involved in the industry down here and there was an opportunity to come down as general manager so I jumped at that opportunity and uh, yeah. You are deeply immersed in Pinot Noir. Yep absolutely. What a great way to be. Um, it's the only way to be. <laughs> in fact, this is one of our young new Pinot blocks that we're just walking into now, which we only planted around about four years old now. But we wanted to try some new clones, and so we took out some of the vines that were here and replanted with this, with this Pinot. So we're, uh, we're pretty excited about these, these blocks. I mean, what we really try to do is experiment with the different parts of the vineyard, picking them separately, fermenting them separately, aging them in barrels separately. So we get to know the nuances of every little corner of our vineyard. And the only way you can do that is actually to break it down into little chunks. You know, if you pick everything and put it into a uh, one big tank, you don't understand all the, the different elements and the nuances of a, of a vineyard and the different parts. And when you actually sit down and taste them, it's all Pinot from one vineyard, but the, the flavors are really different. And that's, we've, we've come to understand that through trial and experimentation over really, what's it's been 20 years or so now. If there's one thing I like more than talking about Pinot, it's drinking Pinot. So back at the cellar door, Will's taking me through a tasting. Down to the business end of this. Yes, let's get stuck into it. So this is a tasting that you would do at yeah. the cellar door? Yes, yeah. we're about Pinot, so we would encourage people to do what we call our expressions of Pinot tasting. It's been a real quantum shift in people's perceptions of, of Tasmanian wine in the last 10 or so years and now recognise that you know, Pinot's you know, what we do and what we do really well. Let's kick things off with the sparkling rosé. Yeah, That's what we like. It's a very happy sound, isn't it? It is. So this is a sparkling rosé? This is our sparkling rosé, yeah. And is it 100% Pinot? It is, yeah, it's uh, all Pinot. There we go. Let's have a taste. Cheers. Cheers. Good health. <laughs> <laughs> smells all right. Mm. So it's quite a dry style. Yes, it is. Yep. Uh, it's got some really nice berry flavours 
you know, being straight Pinot, it's, it tends, the, the difference between the Pinots and the Chardonnays, the Chardonnays tend to be a bit more lemony um, in their characters, where Pinot tends to be more the berries and a little bit of, uh, almost call it like herbaceous sort of uh, mm -hmm. aromatics, and then it has a really lovely, rich palate. You never spit that one out. <laughs> oh my God, that's so delicious. Mm, what's up next? <laughs> so this is what we call our estate Pinot. Mm. Now, in actual fact, all of our wines are estate wines, which means that they're grown on our vineyard. But this wine is a blend of uh, typically around uh, Ooh, 12 or 14 comes. different parcels of Pinot from our property. Right. So Sounds like quite a process. <laughs> it is, it is. And as you know, a lot of these wines, as I say, have been picked separately, fermented separately in, in, in little fermenters, then uh, put into barrel and aged separately and then at the end of it all we've got all these different parcels of wine we could be 40 or 50 different parcels of wine and this wine here we, we sell this through restaurants and bottle shops around Australia uh, so if you're looking for a bottle of Tamer Ridge Pinot this is probably the one you're going to find around the place. Oh yum. So it's got some nice berries and, and a little bit of spice, nice yeah. lifted aromatics. Beautiful spice. Mm. I think the thing about Pinot is it's got flavour uh, and it's got brightness. I don't like to make heavy wines. We want wines that have, that sort of dance on your palate a little <laughs> bit, you know what I mean? Yeah, that have got I do. Really brightness and, and you know what really sets I think the Tasmanian wines apart also is, is that acidity. That's what gives them life and brightness. Mm. It's why sparkling wine does so well down here. Uh, and I think it's what really gives a distinctive character to the Pinots. Uh, we've got ripeness and, and richness, but then there's that underlying acidity that yeah. gives, them, gives the wines some life. Delicious. So this one is your estate. Mm -hmm. You've got your research, which yep. is the sort of experimental one. And yep. then... I've then we go from there, we go to what we call our um, reserve Pinot. Mm -hmm. And so that's uh, typically a couple of blocks that over, mm, gosh, the last 15 or so years, we've uh, identified as, as giving us some really nice fruit characters that we think blend well together and, uh, and create a, a very distinctive style. So and then our final wine in our range at the moment is what we call our single block. So that is a wine from just one particular block or parcel on the vineyard. Do you keep the wines side by side during the tasting so people can sort of go back and yeah. reference? That's the, the that is the way that you really start to understand the differences and the nuances of wine mm. is by giving people you know, four glasses and get to and, and it's, uh, those. it's yeah it's, it's actually quite fun because you you sort of you see these light bulb moments where people yeah. sniff this and go that and they go oh wow I yeah. see what you're talking about and you go that's that's really cool because you know not too many households do you open four or five bottles of red at the same time. I mean, if you're in the industry, it's obligatory, but... Um, it's obligatory. It's obligatory. There you well go. I have to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go anywhere. Plenty more Pinot and gin after the break. vineyard and Will is walking me through one of the Pinot blocks. So with 40 different blocks, yep. how do you stay across that many different... It's a big job, yeah. you know, we are senior winemaker Tom Wallace, that's, you know, so much of what he does is about the logistics of managing those different blocks, working out when to pick them, making sure that during harvest he's got enough little tanks and big tanks to be able to accommodate the various volumes of, of grapes that, uh, the, that come off the different parcels. And then, you know, it's then it's a massive job to follow that through, through the winery, through through the fermentation, and then once that the fermentation blending. is finished, and then yeah, into barrel, and then the blending. And yeah. so, but that's you know that's when people ask the question, you know, why does a, a wine cost more than, than another one? You know, so much of that is is the time that's spent to really, you know, manicure and and uh, and manage, you know, mm. manage a block, manage your barrels and all that sort of thing, and then blend it together, or keep it separate. And sometimes we keep a parcel of wine that we've grown completely separate, don't blend it with any other parcels, and we'll taste that later on, we call it our single block, and that's that's the Pinot that we think is the most complete wine of any given year. And that might only be 
thousand bottles. So we like to benchmark ourselves, you know, against the best pinots mm. around the world, whether that's from Oregon or whether that's from New Zealand or whether that's from Burgundy. Tasmania's reputation globally is being formed around around Pinot Noir, mm. and um, you know, so much of that is to do with the climate. I mean, where we are here in the Tamar Valley, uh, we have a large body of water, which is the Tamar River, only you know, five or six hundred metres away from us. Yeah, there's and a pretty spectacular view from the it, cellar It door. is, it is. And the Tamar is the, the longest navigable estuary in Australia, so it's about 70 kilometres from the mouth into Launceston, and there's a, a three metre tidal range, so that's a massive amount of water coming in and going out um, on a constant basis. And so what that does, it, it acts like a big water bottle. And so, especially in the spring, when you've got the risk of frost and all that sort of thing, um, the vines that are planted close to the river, most often they avoid the, the threat of frost, which of course can kill vines. So the flavours that you get through the vine vary hugely because of that. The warmer sites produce quite different flavours uh, in the wines compared to the cooler sites. And then also you have uh, some of the natural elements of a wine like its acidity. So at the moment, for example, we're looking at some Pinot. This you know, doesn't look like a red grape. That's because it hasn't quite gone through what we call Veraison, where the berries start to soften and they start to get some colour. And somewhere in amongst here, as you can see, we haven't really quite got into Veraison. There might be the odd little bunch that's starting to go red, but in the next couple of weeks, all those bunches will be red and they will start to soften and that's when the, uh, the acid starts to drop, the sugars start to, to lift and uh, it's one of the really critical moments uh, for us in the season, although having said that, it feels like every moment when you're growing grapes is critical. <laughs> critical and at any stage the potential for disaster is always there and it's usually from up above from the climate that yeah. s of which many things we've got not, not much control over. No, but, that's um, right. We take it very seriously and because that's what you've got to do to make a good bottle of wine. But then once you've put it in the bottle, then it's time to actually enjoy it and have some fun. Should so we do that? I think we should. <laughs> Let's go. Ooh, I'm working up a thirst. Back to the tasting. And next, the research. This sounds like the one that you might have the most fun with, with all the experimenting. I mean, the fun thing, I guess, is that you can really try things and push the boundaries a little bit, mm. see where they go. And if it works, that's great. If you end up with a barrel or two that maybe haven't quite worked, well, it's, it's not the end of the world, but it is about you know, exploring and trying to experiment. So we try things and if we find that they work, we then incorporate some of that into our other sure. wines. So it's there's different methods of fermentation. Fermentation and, and whether you crush, the, crush the, uh, the grapes or not, whether you just take a, the bunches and put them all with the stalks and all mm -hmm. together just in a vat, which is what we've done, and just let them all just spontaneously start to ferment by themselves. Is that um, this one? And there's an element of that in this wine. Mm. Let's uh, see what it does in the glass. So I think it's fair to say it's a... It's a, it's a lighter style. It is quite fruity. The fermentation starts actually in the berry itself because you haven't crushed the berry. Mm -hmm. Almost like a sarsaparilla type character. Sure. But, um, and certainly I think it's got some, some interesting herbaceous characters. This also yeah, has... Yeah, it seems to get more that. herbaceous on the yeah. tongue than the first yeah. one. On a warm day, you don't really want a super heavy, super no. ripe, super sweet, alcoholic red wine, but you want something that's a bit bright and a bit fresh and, mm. and you can actually really enjoy that. With, you know, with, some, with that summer like cherry yep. signature. Yeah, 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 mm. absolutely, that's right. Shall we go again? Pop another one in the mix. <laughs> we are now up to the Tamo Ridge Reserve Pinot. So let's have a look at this one. So what sort of flavour differences are we looking for? I'll be honest with you here, this is my favourite of all of our wines. I think it's got a another layer of richness to it. You can if you have a look at the colour, you yeah, can see it's got a really darker colour. Yeah, it's got a really lovely ruby sort of colour. I think it's got an, another level of, of, of richness and depth to the wine, but still, as I say, it's got that brightness and it's got a little Ooh. bit of a smoky aroma. Mm. Yeah. A little bit of spice. Is that usual for a Pinot to have a bit mm. of smoky? It can do, absolutely. But can you see the palate? It's got a real sort mm. of mouth coating richness mm. to the palate. Okay, and the final in the lineup? Right, the single block. Let's single block. Mm. Single block, here we go. It's quite funny, often winemakers and uh, managers are loath to say they have a favourite. 
So this single block's got a bit to live up to. Yeah, all right, we'll see what you think. So this is now a 2017, Ooh. so it's a couple of years older. Mm. So it's had a couple of years sitting in the bottle mm. to mature. So if you look at the colour, it's got uh, just a little bit of extra density to the colour. Yeah. Uh, but it's also showing that it is a couple of years older and in that it's not quite as sort of bright and vibrant as the... As the um, yeah, if we go back. Yeah, some of these other ones. But it's got a lovely, a lovely depth to it. Mmm. It's different, isn't it? So it's very different to the reserve. Mm, very different. different. flavour. If we can run people through a tasting and you walk out going, I think I've learned a little bit of something about Pinot and about Tasmania then, I think we've done our job at the cellar door. So wow. that's, you know, that's what we try to do. Job done, Will. There you go. Thank you so much for sharing Cheers. your Good wines health. with me. My pleasure. <laughs> After the break, it's time for gin. Floral gin. Gosh, it's a tough life. If there's one thing you might have gathered, it's that I'm always partial to a gin. If only there was a gold medal winning distillery next door. Turns out, I'm in luck. Hello Justin. Hi George. Thank you so much for having me at your distillery. Absolutely. Shall we go in and have a look? Yes, let's. Thanks. So Justin, this is your distillery. Absolutely, so our distillery is now just over three years old. So you are renowned for your gin. Yes. Yes. Um, our brand, a core brand is Three Cuts Gen, mm -hmm. which is what we started out with. Um, and it's certainly made an impact on the market. Yeah, it has indeed. We'll get to that. But your history is interesting. It's an interesting one. You've got a little bit of wine in your past, but finance in uh, New York City. Yes. How does one get from there to a distillery in the it's a, it's a great question, and I'm asked it, uh, I think, many times a day. <laughs> we had grown up in the Napa Valley, or just north of Napa, growing up in a California winemaking family. Mm -hmm. But uh, most of my adult life, I did live in New York City and worked in various finance roles well during that 10 years. So. And what took you from there to here? So around 10 years ago, I met my Tasmanian wife. Uh -huh. uh, she was working as a lawyer there. Um, so she had been over there a number of years. And we got introduced on St. Patrick's Day in New York, and the rest is history, so to speak. Lovely. Now, we're heading into the heart of your distillery right now. Yes, yeah, so... Very fancy um, looking uh, still. Well, one of the things that we really wanted to do was have a very open distillery so that all of our customers can engage with everything we're doing. So there's no hidden secrets here. All of our production happens on the distillery floor, whether it's whiskey down on this side, where you can see an active ferment going on, yeah. or our whiskey still coming over on this side. The original intention of this distillery was to be a major whiskey producer and gin obviously came along. Um, it was always part of the plan, but it came along and it exceeded our expectations. Yeah. But our whiskey still, we imported from Portland, Oregon. It's a 3,000 liter still, copper still. And it allows us to do both a single malt and American style whiskey. So it has a really unique design concept that we wanted to incorporate here. Very cool. And you've got your bar here. That's right, so all of our tastings happen up here. Tours down on the ground floor, and we also have a wonderful deck out here overlooking the Tamar River. I can see something else that looks quite wonderful. You've got some gin slushies We do. Under there. We, uh, we wanted to introduce something on hot summer days down here that would be appealing to our customers, so we've uh, done a couple of our Three Cuts Gin Super Slushies Gosh, it's, uh, onto the market, which is very hot today. It is. Would you guys like to have one? Oh, yes, that sounds great. What Come, a good idea. Coming right up. <laughs> Erica. <laughs> so it's a beautiful spot that you're in. Yeah, we have a really fantastic spot here in the heart of the Tamar Valley. And this building was a winery? This was a former winery built in the late 90s that had sat idle for well over 10 years. When I came looking for a distillery location, this is just fit everything we needed for a distillery as a, as a craft distillery. It was a beautiful two-floor building with room to grow, and so we set out on uh, renovating it shortly after I moved here. So what was it that drew you to this particular location? The famous, iconic Tamar Valley wine route was just too good to pass up. Most distilleries, you know, would be lucky to be in an industrial yard or you might have a small location in the city. But being in the major wine route was just an amazing opportunity you would find. Yeah. And then right next door, obviously, having Tamar Ridge, which is a really established brand and name, it's just a fantastic opportunity. I always had wanted to come back to my passion project, which was a craft distillery 
found this location during one of my trips back to Tasmania. And you're still running it solo or you've got uh, no, a bit of help, one, I During assume. one of my <laughs> early trips here, I got introduced through a friend of the family to Brett Coulson. Brett's a former brewer and I thought he'd make an excellent addition to the team. So I brought Brett on early days and he's now our lead distiller. And I believe you offer a tour that makes the most of this unique. We do, as having Tamar Ridge as our site partner, we wanted to embrace both the distillery and winery on the same property. So we do a joint distillery and wine tour offering daily, which also includes a food offering as well. So and that doesn't sound like something you'd find elsewhere. You wouldn't, you wouldn't find it really many places anywhere in the country. It's just quite unique to have us as site partners here. And so we're really lucky to have, have a partner like Tamar Ridge here on the property. Well, I would like to opt into the gin tasting. Shall we? Absolutely. Get stuck Let's into go that? have a try. Excellent. So this is the famous Brett. This is the famous Brett. Our lead distillery started with us in the very beginning. He of uh, our duo is the local Tasmanian. We've got a few of your creations here. Shall we have a little taste? Absolutely. So we've got four gins here on display. So we'll begin with our founder's release, which is our, our blue label. This is the one we put out initially three years ago. We want to do a little bit something different compared to a lot of the Tasmanian gins on the market, which primarily use lemon, myrtle, and pepperberry, which is great for, for all those gins. We wanted to just have a slightly different twist on it. And since we're in the Tamar Valley, we look for local botanicals. Um, we use 12 total botanicals with both of these gins. With our founder's release, we use some beautiful local fresh limes, Tasmanian limes. Which are? Uh, yes, um, which are our <laughs> limes. A slightly more aromatic lime compared to, to a mainland Australia lime. And then we look for something else a little bit different in our botanical recipe. And of course, we've got juniper, which you have to have in all gin to be called gin. But we found a local florist, actually a rose grower, one of the biggest in the state. And we collaborated with them early on and distilled their fresh rose petals in our gin. That's so gorgeous. Yes, yeah, so the, the word three cuts gin is derived from the three cuts of rose that we distill into our gin. So you get a slight floral note in all of our gins, but it's not overpowering. Shall so we this, taste it? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> so this first gin, again, you get a nice citrus hit from the lime, a little bit of the floral. We also have some white peppercorn um, and a bit of cinnamon bark in this gin. So you get a little bit of sweetness, a little bit of spice, floral and citrus notes, and the combination make this a beautiful gin. This is our founder's release. The very first. The very first. There's a hint of rose, mm. but it's not at all, not what I was expecting. No, we didn't, if you have too much floral uh, up front, then it will overpower it. Yeah, we <laughs> yeah. didn't want that. We wanted a balanced gin, but also mm. has slight floral notes. And then you do get it towards the back end. Yeah. Um, a splash of soda or tonic will open the florals up a little bit as well in this gin. And you, know, you could drink it with soda water, tonic, a light, um, or a great base for cocktails as well. Like so, a gin slushy. Like a gin slushy. Perfect, that's lovely. And it's not just gin they distill here. Being American in Tasmania, certainly I think it'd be a, be a shame if we didn't embrace a little bit of my background. And so we really wanted to embark on trialing a little bit with, um, you call it American style whiskey, which would be a rye or a bourbon or a corn whiskey. But all the equipment we have, the whiskey equipment is from the States actually, which allows us to do different types of whiskey. So we are in the process of doing our first uh, corn whiskey as we speak right now with all Tasmanian grown uh, grains. Which what is, a lovely marriage of American and Tasmanian. So how long do we have to wait for that one? <laughs> a little Ooh. while. <laughs> Come back in a couple of years and yeah. we'll be getting yeah. closer. Yeah. <laughs> you, is your single malt released yet or is it? Can't rush a good thing, No, unfortunately. No. I'll be watching this space, but in the meantime, back to the gin. I know this is popular, but this guy, you won best gin in Australia. Pretty good. Last year was a good year for us, yeah. So whereas the founders release yeah, is a little bit more that floral, earthy, you know, a little bit of that lime hit at the start. The second gin that came out about 12 months after the first is a big, bold citrus hit. There's a lot of fresh lemons, a lot of fresh limes in there. Spice-wise, we've gone for some whole green cardamom pods. You've got your little setup up yeah. there, don't you? Yes, we do. So um, the cardamom are these here. Look, it's a great spice to work with. A little goes a long way. Mm -hmm. And then there's some whole white pepper corn in this one as well. So neat. You'll get a little bit more of the spice. Mm -hmm. 
people love is a gin and tonic. It just stands up a little bit it's more the, to tonic. That's citrusy. Well, and it's a little bit more juniper for it as well. Mm. So it, it's um, one the judges certainly love, which is why it's taken right. out a couple of <laughs> awards besides the Australia Gin Awards. Best of show of two months ago in Sydney. We'd also won Best International Gin prior to that in the States. Mm, congratulations. Um, and uh, Gold in London as well. So it's doing quite well for us. Yeah. And so what about the other two we've got here? The barrel? See, right, so those are our barrel rested gins, we call them. So the barrel age category is a bit niche still, mm -hmm. um, globally. Since we're in wine country, we really wanted to tie in to the, the wine theme here in the Tamar Valley. And since we're next door to Tamar Ridge, mm -hmm. we've purchased our ex Pinot and Chardonnay cast and did, had multiple vintages in them right here in the Tamar Valley. It was important for us to tie in with that local story. Um, no one had ever done it in Tasmania before, done a, a prior wine cast for aging their gin. So it was an experiment. We ended up taking our founders, at least the original gin. We distill it like normal and it goes in this cast for, for not a long period, between three and six months, which is why we call them barrel rested as opposed to barrel aged. Sure, delicious. I'm have to uh, knock this one back and then maybe we'll get stuck into a few of those later. Let's, thanks so much for coming in today. Our pleasure. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> It was a quick but fruitful trip to the Apple Isle this time, and I will see you next time on The Cellar Door. Bye-bye.